Okay, I believe that we are live now, hoping technology-wise that we're doing okay. So hello everyone, welcome to Sunday Connections. This is our monthly opportunity through the Contemporary Art Center to um, just kind of chat with some of the artists that we get the opportunity to work with. Um, so I am Beth Boswell. I'm the Teen and Adult Programs Manager at the CAC, and today we are joined by Terrence Hammonds. Thank you for joining us, Terrence. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely. For anyone who is watching, um, you are welcome to add questions as we chat. Anything that you would like to know about Terrence, um, we will be able to kind of talk through as we have this conversation. Um, but first of all, Terrence, I just would kind of love to start from the very beginning. So Terrence not only has an exhibit in our Unmuseum right now, but also is our artist in resident at the moment. Um, but I would kind of like to back up all the way to your background. So um, I do have your bio, but if you want, I was just thinking that you could just kind of talk through your background a little bit with me. Okay, uh, I'm Terrence Hammonds. I was born here in Cincinnati, Ohio. I attended the School of Creative and Performing Arts. Is that too far back? No, that's perfect. That's what I want. I want to know your okay. life here in Cincinnati. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up on Main Street <laughs> and over the Rhine. And I attended the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and Tufts University. That's perfect. And then you've been working here in Cincinnati ever since, correct? Correct. Correct. Yes. So... Um, then I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and um, just kind of lead to 2019, where we had an exhibition open in the Unmuseum, your exhibition, The Fun okay. Within You. And I know that <laughs> kind of skips a few steps, so we're going to kind of loop all over the place throughout. Okay. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about the funk within you and what kind of led up to that exhibit and your thought process coming yeah, to that? Absolutely. Um, well, first it started with the invitation from uh, the education department at the CAC and uh, Jamie Thompson to be exact. Um, I had made a series of dance floors uh, a couple years prior and uh, Jamie and I talked about how something like that uh, that sort of engaged the audience uh, would be appropriate for the Unmuseum. So I took the opportunity to sort of update this idea of the dance floors. When I originally did them, they celebrated the civil rights movement. Uh, this one, this time I focused on uh, the origin story of hip hop and uh, break dancing. Uh, to be exact, and uh, thinking about the street gangs that turned into the breakdancing crews, and I, uh, the dance floors were decorated with images, some of the first reproduced images of breakdancers, as well as uh, some of the early practitioners of breakdancing, and, uh, and the street gangs that started those things, uh, started those groups, sorry. Uh, and then wallpaper with the first, with a little bit of like, I mean, there's a little bit of fudging that story, but of the first 250 rap artists to record music. And I threw in some of my favorites as well. <laughs> so is that the fudging, throwing in a few of your favorites? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's good though. I think it has a nice personal touch that way. Um, like and Sorry. how personally does this all tie back to you? How did this kind of, um, thinking begin. Okay, well, I was gonna say that, like, I think of the artist in the wallpaper as sort of a mixtape. So uh, I have rules of what I need to put in, but then you gotta put in some flavor of some of your favorites and things like that, some surprises. Absolutely. Uh, the personal connection, um, well, I guess the personal connection would be, I had a, how do I explain this? I had a cousin who uh, was a break dancer and, uh, I think I think my earliest memory of hip hop includes this cousin playing uh, Dougie Fresh's The Show for me for the first time on a 12 inch maxi single um, <laughs> on my mother's record player, which we weren't allowed to touch, but my older cousin could. So it was a very special occasion. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was like, what is this music? This is amazing. And um, and so anyway, um, 
to me, hip hop and those, it, it becomes sort of like family stories, like the origin of hip hop. Uh, I start to think of like th the reasons why hip hop started and is like social, economic and all those things and how those sort of relate to, and they resonated with like kids in the Midwest. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered your question or if I just rambled, but. No, I think that's perfect. And I think rambling is okay today because I just want to pick your brain a little bit, hear a little bit about it. Um, I've got to ramble too. Like as well. Um, so then kind of looping forward, I know that you have had the opportunity to witness your exhibition come alive. So for those who have not seen it, and unfortunately, um, it opened in late 2019 and um, closed down with the close of the museum in March of 2020. So we only had a few months to really interact, but the exhibit does have a DJ booth. And so you have gotten to see that come alive in many ways. Can you describe that to me at all? Uh, yeah, so I wanted to have a sort of interactive element besides the, the dance floors, which are activated when people dance with them. Um, there's also a projection of the first 10 years of Soul Train, uh, Soul Train lines um, done, done in a loop. Uh, to sort of give um, inspiration for dance moves, uh, but not just in for in inspiration. Uh, it's really interesting because you see some some dance moves like the TikTok dances and like uh, even some of the African dances that I was sort of into at the time. That like uh, you can see like the prototypes for those moves in yeah. these dance moves that were happening in the seventies. So there's like some early hip hop moving and, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, back to the, uh, the instruments. So I wanted to have uh, some sort of interactive element other than the dance floor and the video. And I thought the, the um, drum machines are really good part, a good way of doing that. I, I worked with, um, a musician and artist, uh, Skylar Smith, to help find the most user-friendly instruments we could find. Um, and I think we did a really good job. These are actual instruments that you could, you know, make serious beats, as my son calls them. <laughs> sick beats. You can make some seriously sick beats with these machines. <laughs> That so, is awesome. So that was a collaboration that came together with someone else, but how did this exhibit come together? And I guess what I mean by that is, can you tell me a little bit about your studio space and where you are working when you are creating exhibitions? Oh, so all the stuff sort of has to come together in my mind first. So, and and sometimes that's, uh, I, I rarely do this, but sometimes I make maquettes of the space and then figure that out. Uh, but I have a small studio space. So a lot of the work that I do starts as sort of modular things. Um, and so if it's tiles or even I was doing these large uh, wallpaper, well, for this, I did a large wallpaper piece and it's made in two foot by, I think, 12 foot sections. Um, I'm not sure how tall the walls there are there. I think they're 12. I don't know that answer either, but I think you're pretty close. So, well. <laughs> so two by 12 foot sections, which is, uh, I live in an old, my, my studio's in my house and I live in an old Victorian. Uh, so I do have walls that space that large, but I don't have open walls that large that I can um, lay out the wallpaper and make sure that it lines up perfectly. So, um, I work from home. My family leaves to my wife's a teacher and I have two kids and they go to school. And then, so basically the entire house becomes my studio. So, uh, yeah. So I print the wallpaper in the basement and then I bring it upstairs to the dining room. I push the table all the way back and then lay out the wallpaper to make sure that it lines up. Cause I was creating a pattern, um, with the way that the, uh, portraits were, displayed in different color. So it had to line up kind of perfectly for each panel. So uh, those get rolled out. I do the math, make sure that everything lines up. And then at two o'clock, I turn into a pumpkin and then everything gets rolled up and the house turns back into the house that my family would recognize when they came home. <laughs> of course. <laughs> to the house that they left, so yeah. Yes, <laughs> uh, with, I'm guessing with a little bit of mess left behind every once in a while. A little bit. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, and how has that changed in months of being at home? How has your work process? It doesn't go anywhere. The family doesn't go anywhere. So I I work in the basement. I uh, I also don't take on. Well, I haven't done a wallpaper project because I can only do that when um, the conditions are right in the house. Right. So, um, but the summer and I guess at the beginning of like lockdown, I was working on a project for the art museum. And that was um, basically printing on um, printing on wood panels uh, and then cutting those wood panels out uh, using a scroll saw in my garage. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I would, I would sneak away when I could and uh, work on those things in the basement or in the garage. Uh, a lot of this, the things shifted to like working to after the kids were asleep. Uh, we have, I have an aunt, Lori, who's amazing, Lori Pike, who's an amazing writer, who uh, takes our kids uh, two days a week. And so that also gives us, gives me time to work in the studio as well. I think one of my favorite things about getting to know you is hearing you talk about this almost like mishmash of ways that you find the opportunity to work. And I think, um, this kind of leads into now the residency that you're doing. So Terrence is currently our artist in resident. And I think one thing that I could learn and that I um, am loving to see other people learn from you is the way that you work around barriers. So a lot of times I have created barriers in my head for why I can't create artwork because I don't have the space or because I don't have the time. And I feel like I've watched you just be like, no, I'm gonna do it. Um, even if you want to kind of describe the situation with the plywood that you talked to me about a little bit, I think it was the plywood in this current exhibition where you had extra pieces left behind or. Um, oh, yeah. They're from a crate from a, um, the first time I did the dance floors, or maybe it was the second time I did the dance floors. I showed them at a part, they were part of uh, the state of the art. And it was at uh, the Crystal Bridges. I can't exactly remember the year, but um, luckily I have sold the dance floors, but the crate was still hanging around, taking up a lot of space in my garage. And um, the opportunity arose to do the residency at the Rosenthal. And um, I just, <laughs> I don't know, something silly in my head was like, you know, you could learn how to work with with power tools and you could get rid of all this wood. And um, cause I was, I don't know. I always think of art as like, I create a problem for myself and then I try to solve it. And this was another opportunity to create a problem and solve it. And, uh, and it had, a, I guess, another benefit of like being some, a coping, me coping mechanism uh, during the, the lockdown and all the other social upheavals that were happening because it gave me a deadline. It gave me um, a thing to struggle towards. I could, it was a great distraction. Uh, I could also like, you know, I had a reason to be like, all right, dad's got to go to the garage. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it, it was honestly like uh, a life send. I mean, it really, a lifesaver. It really, really, really helped me in the last couple of months, just having, I mean, I had a problem to solve, so yeah. that was solvable, not like, you know, racial injustice and like all the horrible things that are happening in the world that I don't feel like I can solve myself. Of course, of course. I think that is a good way to, um, yeah, maybe be a distraction, maybe be a little bit of um, peace in the world. So for anyone who does not know, can you kind of piece together what your life looks like for me as an artist right now because um, <laughs> you have many moving parts and so what what is your combination of life right now when it comes to the art world uh i don't, I don't know how to describe this uh i don't know to me it just seems like it's my business this is what i do uh i i teach at the art academy two days a week i um i'm during the residency at the Contemporary Art Center. So I'm there two days a week. And then uh, when I'm not doing either one of those things, I am struggling to get my kids onto Zoom meetings and, <laughs> and to do their classwork uh, at home. Uh, and then at night I am uh, 
either reading books that I'm gonna, or articles or literature that I'm gonna have to give to the class the next day or, or um, trying to sneak in. I have a couple commissions that I've been trying to slowly finish. Absolutely. There's a lot of like, I'm sorry, I'm not done yet. I'm sorry, I'm not done yet. <laughs> You are moving in a lot of directions, and I am perpetually impressed by that. Um, I think when you came into the residency, you might have even had one or two more projects going on. That's funny. Um, I like I'm perpetually letting people down. So, <laughs> well, from my perspective, you are absolutely not. Perfect. So, um, for those watching, our residency is an opportunity for um, an artist to come into the museum two nights a week for a three month span of time and um, create their own artwork while also working with any visitors. So this is an all ages program, but it is an educational residency. So different to some traditional residencies in the past, you are always working with students. And um, while Terrence is able to create a little bit of his own work, primarily what we're doing is sharing his work with an audience. And I would say typically a young adult audience, but this program is open to everyone. So what were your um, initial thoughts when we started talking about the residency in terms of kind of creating artwork and projects for the residency? Well, my initial thoughts were that we would, oh, this is again, we, the <laughs> conversation started before go COVID, so mm -hmm. it was a whole different world. And I think the initial thoughts were just to, uh, one, expand on the, you know, using the techniques and themes that I work with already, and then um, and then creating projects where I where I, I could explore those and expose other people to those techniques. Um, that's the other opportunity I thought was a, a chance to sort of um, collaborate with the visitors. So, um, like with the silk screening project, where I um, because of the nature of silk screening, um, a lot of the pre-press stuff has to be done beforehand. So I would do that and then it creates an opportunity for the visitors to react to the things that I've printed or come up with other images to, uh, to add to the conversation with the images that I've created. Absolutely. And one of the pieces, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the poster that is the entrance to um, your residency, as well as some of the pieces that you've created along the way within your own silk screening process. So um, Terrence's poster leading in is a series of protesters and you have pulled from um, various other artworks in order to create this print, correct? Correct. So they're, um, they're historic photographs of protest um, spanning lots of different ideas and 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 uh eras um so there's um there's pro there's images from i think gay rights civil rights women's rights uh obviously i think that all those things are interconnected until uh, no one is you know no one is free until we're all free right. absolutely and i if i believe if i'm correct that poster was created earlier in the year, um, or it may have come about right when we were experiencing a lot of, not that we are done experiencing unrest here in the US, but. It's actually an older print that I think I may have done a year ago. So it's a silk screen. It's, these are themes that I've been working on for years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, so I've, I've always been inspired by the idea that people got together to, um, put their, their necks on the line basically to um, to uplift their fellow man. They saw an injustice and something had to be done. And so uh, a lot of my work is about um, making monuments to social transgression, to those people who literally put their necks on the line to save their fellow man. Um, people who fought for civil rights even though they were not immediately affected by, um, like Jim Crow and all this and, and, and other horrible injustices, mm -hmm. um, but felt the need to to stand up for what was right. Um, so yeah, these are I, I make I make monuments to that. I, I think that like these <laughs> these are things that we should celebrate. Um, 
And so that poster, that poster, which is a print came from that. Absolutely. I think your um, residency is so well-timed and it was something that we kind of, we already had organized in advance, but um, it's just so perfect that we had the opportunity to work with you right now. And so we, um, last week at the Contemporary Art Center, we were able to put together a voter event and Terrence created some artworks for that. So do you wanna talk about um, any of the artworks that you created as a part of that event? Yeah, I made a, um, a print that could be printed on tote bags, which I think, again, like, like the cups that I make or the vases, they're like these sort of, um, they seem very simple things that we interact with every day, but they can say a lot. They're, they're opportunities to say a lot about who we are and what we believe in. Um, so I, I really like tote bags. <laughs> and so I like them a lot as a medium. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, I made an image that said vote and, and each one of the uh, letters were uh, made up of a photograph from a different civil rights movement. So again, from uh, women's uh, lib to uh, gay rights, to civil rights and uh, environmental rights, things like that. I think we have four letters, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think those are the four things I, I pulled from. And those prints turned out so cool. And we will continue doing those for the next couple of weeks. So Terrence will be with us until November. And I believe that we will have the opportunity for anyone to come collaborate on one of Terrence's prints. So we will likely be printing more of those prints where you can draw or you can print on top or you can work with Terrence to um, be a part of his artwork and kind of play a role in that collaboration as well. And then, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I think a really important element, and I may have talked or missed this opportunity to talk about it earlier, is that like people are walking away with uh, something that they've made and something that I've made as well. Um, and so it's it's a way of sort of breaking down those barriers of art and and the gatekeepers of, uh, of commerce and all that other stuff. And just, it's really about conversation and sharing. And I think this is a really beautiful opportunity to give a bunch of stuff away. <laughs> <laughs> that is a perk of the residency in general is that, or a lot of our programming in general is that it's free and that you walk away with some sort of product that you were able to create. And in, in this scenario, people are able to walk away with a product that you created as well. So that's, yeah. that's, um, I just really exciting. I think at least for me, I just wanted to match the generosity of the, of the, the moment, the event. Um, and it was a great opportunity to do that. And I, and it's one of those things that I, I I'm really appreciative about the opportunity. So outside of that event, we are creating the opportunity for students to um, screen print. And I think that's something that not everyone is familiar with. I will say at least at the high school level, I was not familiar or didn't have the opportunity. So can you explain what one excited you about printmaking and then to kind of that screen printing opportunity for our students. Um, so I think I was excited about printmaking or so screen printing because of Andy Warhol. And I think that like, I and at the start in like the fourth grade, I was obsessed with like the factory and, and like Bohemians and, and I was obsessed with the idea of being cool. And I think my idea of what cool was, was not cool by anybody other standards, but but mine, and so, <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so, um, and then the other thing is that it, it's such an immediate process. Um, you do need a couple, you need some equipment and stuff like that, but it is like, it's one of those like printmaking techniques that um, almost anyone can do with a little bit of, a little bit of background knowledge. Um, I like to call it, it's like the printmaking of the people. So, um, and yeah, you make, uh, I've made posters and t-shirts and all kinds of stuff with it. And, and I think that's the, the, the pull or the lure of it to me. Um, and yeah, I think silk screens, punk rock. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's one of the, yeah, it's, it's, it, it is part of, I mean, I'm going to age myself, but I grew up in the eighties and nineties. 
um, and the 90s. And um, the sort of do-it-yourself aesthetic was really important to me. And uh, silk screening is a big part of that. And also the work is all collage based, which is also, I think, really important. So at what point did you begin printmaking? Do you remember when you started? Um, started print, well, I was, I was spoiled. I was lucky. I started printmaking probably in the fourth grade. Um, because of SCPA, I had at least two hours of art from fourth to 12th grade. Every, so, amazing yeah. opportunity. And you've talked to me a little bit about, um, kind of starting here in Cincinnati and, and growing here in Cincinnati. And I think this is something really cool to hear from the residency perspective, because as a part of the residency, we want to talk about the ways that you can be a working artist here in Cincinnati. So how early would you say that, that you working, your art became work here in the Cincinnati area? Uh, geez. I I think I got my first show at like 15 at uh, the base art gallery, which was on main street. Um, and then I think my second show was at Caldi's and I was like maybe 16. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, I'm sure the art was bad, um, really bad, but. Um, I really wish we had some photo files right now of the art that was like, you know, <laughs> 17 year old shows. and. Were those printmaking? Was it printmaking even at that point? Um, no, I think at that point I was doing painting and some form of collage. Okay. Uh, yeah. I th it really wasn't until like college that I really got into, um, to, to, into screen printing. Um, I, I worked for Mark Patsfall right after high school um, and, at the Clay Street Press. And we were doing limited edition screen prints for like the Fluxus movement. The first job I worked on was for Nam June Paik. Um, I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, I mean, so I, I, I love process. So I loved all forms of printmaking except for lithography. Um, that just wasn't my thing. Um, but so, and with it, and I'm sure I'm not answering your question, but at Mark's, I had the opportunity to to work on uh, relief printing and silk screening and, and etching, um, those things that were super interesting to me. Yeah. So when you moved back after grad school, you moved back to Cincinnati pretty quickly after grad school, correct? Correct. Um, were you continuing to work on printmaking at that time? Yes. So I moved back. I had just won uh, the Traveling Scholars Award um, at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, in Boston, and I used that money to move back to Cincinnati uh, to rent a place um, that was two hundred dollars a month, and I was splitting that with the roommate. Um, so I had really low overhead, and it was an opportunity to work closely with Mark Patsfall. Um, Mark Patsfall is like this gem of a human being and a printmaker here in in Cincinnati. Uh, I mean, there were world-renowned artists coming in and out of of that space, as well as collectors. Um, I mean, Jack White, I met Jack White there, just one day printing, just showed up uh, to look at the art show that was there. Um, anyway, um, it that I learned more working with Mark than I did in any of my years of schooling. Um, it's just really, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent. Really one of the most incredible people and, and, and such an important person to my art practice and um, and introducing me to so many people. Awesome. I'm very grateful. So I think this, I think I kind of expect your answer to this question, which is why I ask it now. Um, for any of our students that come in and they ask you, um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to go to art school or someone who wants to begin an art career? Um, what would be your bit of advice to those students? I have a couple, I think. Uh, one would be um, go to the best school that you can afford. Uh, <laughs> uh, get as far away from your parents and family as you can. Uh, I know that sounds weird, but it's like, it's really important to be sort of uncomfortable, I think. Um, and um, 
I think after, out of that uncomfortableness comes like some independence and, and uh, I think that that's really, really important for young artists. Um, but then going back to comfort, like once you know yourself, if you need that comfort, like for me, it was really important to move back to Cincinnati and not struggle to pay my rent because if I struggled to pay my rent, then that's what I would do and I wouldn't be making art as much. Right. Um, my other advice would be um, make friends with the smartest person in the class. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's always someone smarter than you. And then, uh, yeah, I for me that was like the biggest benefit is like whoever's like pushing the conversation further, like be around that dude or or, or person, and 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 that person will help push you, and you can push them. Blah blah blah. Uh, the other thing would be uh, trade with your friends. <laughs> uh, make friends, trade things, uh, use your resources. Um, yeah, I, I think that's for most people. Use your resources. Absolutely. Uh, out of school, but I think crazy enough, what you might know, what you might not realize right now, and I know this because getting to talk to you um, on a regular basis, you are one of the most humble people that I've ever met. Is that you are that resource for a lot of the students that come into our space right now. Um, you are a resource for things like this type of advice, but also for new techniques or connections or whatever it is, you've kind of um, been that resource for, for me, for our interns, for our students that have come in, um, which is really amazing. One thing that we've gotten to talk about a little bit, and this does, does kind of segue, but I wanna touch on this part of your art is, um, that a lot of your printmaking is um, ceramic based. And how did you go from printing on paper to printing in ceramics? How did you make that jump? Well, part of it goes to the sort of problem, setting up a problem for myself and then trying to solve it. Um, with printmaking, or at least with silk screening, it's all about the substrate. And then like, you can print on anything if you can figure out the right vehicle or the right uh, ink body to go on that substrate. Um, so <sighs> ceramics, I had, I had sort of like flirted with printing on ceramics with, um, with printing on antiques, um, and doing like super low fire decals on antiques. Um, but like, to me, that wasn't real enough. So, um, but at, at one point and I mean, I guess this has more to do with like convenience and opportunity than actually like planning something out. I ended up working at the Rookwood Pottery. Um, and after working for Mark for a while, I ended up working at the Rookwood Pottery. And I was surrounded by clay, also having this sort of idea from, you know, my first or second year of college about printing on ceramics. And so I, was fortunate enough after a while working at Rookwood to um, to be hired to experiment on figuring out techniques of how to print on ceramics. So um, there are lots of books on it, but all that, all of those information, all the information in the books that I was finding was was very very dated, and there were never any recipes, or if there were like supplies or list of like materials, they were incredibly hard to find or non-existent at, by the time I was searching for them. Um, so I basically <laughs> uh, stumbled, I tried, I talked to friends, I was lucky enough to work with at Rookwood. And so there was the glaze chemist at the time, um, uh, God, I I'm, I'm, can't believe I'm forgetting his last, his first name. Um, Robinson was his last name, but um, an amazing, super smart guy who was, who's always, whatever a question I asked, the answer was like, I don't know, let's try it. So we would uh, come up with lots of recipes and try it. So anyway, I ended up using the stains that you use to make glazes. Uh, so Mason stains or Indica stains and mixing those with uh, silkscreen medium. Uh, to make, to get and mix it to the right viscosity. And then I print it directly onto clay and to see what would happen. And, and to be com completely honest, I started with just printing with glaze 
and it wasn't, and Jim was his name, Jim Robinson. And Jim, <laughs> this is totally never going to work, but you should try it. And I tried it, it worked. And then he was like, this shouldn't work. You should try more. So we kept pushing it until we came up with a recipe that was pretty solid. And, um, and yeah, to this day, it still works. And I, I, I'd like to share that recipe to anyone who, uh, who's interested because I searched so hard for it for so long to sort of figure out how to silk screen onto ceramics. And so um, I, I share it freely <laughs> when asked. Which I absolutely love. I think uh, we we artists should stick together kind of thought process, which I definitely think is something that I, I see you live by a lot as well as the, okay, let's just try this um, experiment or try something new. Is that something that you are still utilizing or what medium are you focusing on right now in this moment? So um, the convenience part of that was, I was working at Rookwood. Mm -hmm. I was paid to experiment with <laughs> with uh, with the glazes and and figuring out different techniques of uh, printing on ceramics. So um, so a lot of those experiments, um, ideas would start happening, and and so a lot of art came from that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my personal art came from that. A lot of things through Rookwood came from that. Um, so it it was I, I was in a ceramics factory, so it was really convenient to do ceramics. I am no longer in a ceramics factory. So at my house, I have a uh, silk screen unit, um, exposure unit. So I, I print on paper a lot here. Um, and, but I can also print on wood and, and because I'm at my house, I, it has to be water-based inks. So any substrate that would allow me to print on it water-based, I do here. Uh, okay. I also do a little bit of, I've been working on a little bit of ceramics here as well. That's awesome. Um, so right now, because we are kind of coming closer to the end, I just want to remind anyone who is watching that you have the opportunity to ask some questions live for Terrence and have him answer anything specific or burning that you have going on. But I'm just going to keep going for a moment and let um, let people ask their questions if they need to. Um, but now kind of thinking about the future. So we are in this residency and you are um, working from home, doing a lot of artwork from home. You're also home with your children quite a lot right now. What <laughs> are some things that you are excited for the, for, for the future? And by that, I don't need for it to be art, but it can be art. <laughs> um, but what are some things that you are thinking about or what are some things that you are hopeful for or, yeah. I'm making a chicken pot pie tonight. And I'm really excited <laughs> about that. <laughs> I love cooking. Um, so I wake up in the morning thinking about cooking. <laughs> so, and maybe that's a bit of a um, escape from the rest of this right now. Yeah, but I mean, um, it's been this way for years. <laughs> I like to eat. <laughs> I'm coming over sometime for whatever the dinners are that you have described to me. Absolutely. So this is a very um, similar question. Oh, sorry. Keep going if you if you had more thoughts. But I think this kind of ties in is uh, Jody Huber asked us, how are you overcoming current obstacles? Um, I don't know that I am, to be completely honest. Um, I, mean, I mean, I'm not sure which, like, I'm not sure which obstacles were, but like the social things that are happening. And um, I, I cry. Um, I I cook. I hug my kids real tight. I um, I love my wife real hard. <laughs> um, I call my mother. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, these are things that recharge my battery that make me yeah. feel good. Um, yeah, I think those are really good, really honest answers. And then one more that I have for you that kind of ties in is. Um, so community is a huge part of your art. And so how can community still play a role in your art? Um, how can it not play a role in your art? Um, and I guess, how do you see it playing a role in your art in the future? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, honestly, I think my practice is a, about uh, one, like there's things that are really, um, 
private. So like the cups that I make are for people to sort of enjoy by themselves. Um, and they're, I guess, messages for yourself. Um, and you have, I feel like you have an intimate relationship with the cup. You're putting it to your mouth, you're drinking. Um, the same with the plates the, and the platters. Those become more about community and sharing and starting conversations. And I think the thing that I try to do most of my art is I don't have any answers. I, I make this stuff to sort of like figure things out or it's my coping mechanism for being confused and not knowing the right thing about the world. Um, and I, th I think in a way it acts as maybe a, um, maybe it's like the cheerleader, like you can do this too. Like people worked really hard. So you can be here doing what you're doing now, yeah. keep doing it because it's rad. Um, <laughs> we, we all need that right now. <laughs> I need that reminder on a daily basis. Absolutely. So I think that's a really amazing um, description of the way that community ties into your art. Um, I'm going to keep uh, asking a few of the questions that we have from visitors. Okay. So Terrence, how important is research in your creating? How do you organize it? Um, and then just very physically digital or paper files. Okay. Uh, both digital and paper. Organizing is a really loose term <laughs> because uh, uh, I'm, 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 quite disorganized it's a little bit of a secret um, <laughs> and so um and the resource research uh is the most fun i mean i think that's part of what got me into all of this as a kid i was a little bit of a latch key and i and the safe place for me to sort of hang out was the library so i love to dive into um whatever subject i am interested in at the time or whatever story I'm trying to tell. Yeah. And then tying into that, um, music seems to be a big influence. What do you listen to when working on your art? And also just for anyone who has not heard it, can you touch on the music that plays in your art or is a component of your art as well, even if that is totally different from what you are personally listening to? Uh, yeah, yeah, music's a huge influence. Um, I listen to a little bit of everything. It, it's it's funny, um, but it sometimes doesn't really make sense. When I was doing the project about funk, I was listening to a lot of like freak folk, like uh, like Devander Banhart and uh, the Dirty Projectors, and um, and then um, but then sometimes. When I was doing the Afropunk wallpaper, I was super into the Bad Brains again. They were one of my favorite bands when I was a kid and I was really into that again. Uh, but then, you know, it could really be anything. Uh, yeah, I I just, I don't know. I've, I've just been sort of, a, always been like a sort of music nerd and I really love it. Yeah, I really love it. And you came into our residency, I think it wasn't my first night meeting you, but it was my first night ever getting to like really hang out with you. Do you remember who you were hooked on when you first started the residency? Oh, was it the Beastie Boys again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you came in. It's really embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just like, I, I was listening to the Beastie Boys audio book and I was like, this is the most amazing art that I've heard in a while. Um, it, really, it, it sort of con confirmed a, a bunch of things that I was feeling about collage. Um, yeah. And then there, you know, the way the audio book was produced is there's a lot of really interesting people reading uh, different excerpts from the, the book. So anyway. Absolutely. And you've talked a lot, um, you talk a lot about music and the way it ties to your art. And one question that um, I got a chance to ask you a while back was, um, who, who would your ideal collaboration be? Because I think the first time I asked you that question, you even maybe answered a few mu musicians. Um, but you don't have to right now. But just who would your ideal art collaboration be with? I don't know. I, I, you know, to be completely honest, I knew you were going to ask this question, but um, I, I don't know. Uh, 
I mean, off the top of my head, I think like Rebecca Morgan would be amazing to work with. Um, uh, Hank Willis Thomas is amazing. Um, obviously, I'd like to work with him. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I think those were your answers previously. <laughs> so it means that you have that you have a consistent group of artists that you would be really excited to work with. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I really could go on. I mean, like Yinka Shonibar, um, Maurizio Calon. There's, I mean, there's lots of people that I, I totally love. Uh, I am really lucky right now at the Art Academy. I'm working with two of my favorite local artists, uh, Jimmy Baker and Emily Mamahara. Um, if you don't know their work, you should check it out. They're both amazing. So what um, what do each of their works focus on? Just briefly. Uh, Jimmy is a painter, and um, he used to do these amazing portraits and beautiful landscapes, and now he's doing these uh, really, really sick uh, abstract paintings. Uh, he's also a musician, <laughs> which he's a drummer. I, um, I always become friends with drummers for some reason. Uh, they're like, like guitars are kind of assholes, but drummers are really like <laughs> really smart and cool. Uh, anyway, uh, and, and uh, Emily is a photographer and she makes really amazing uh, photo essays and um, about race. Um, uh, she's, she's really, really, really brilliant. She also did a children's book that my son is in as well. <laughs> That's awesome. That it all ties together here in Cincinnati. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like one and a half degrees of separation. So for anyone who um after listening in today wants to come make art with you and make art with us, um what can you are working hard as I am? <laughs> <laughs> But I am not designing the projects. So I'm going to leave it back to you. Um, <laughs> what can people expect if they want to come join us for the next, um, we've got a little over a month left. Well, I, well, we're going to be doing more silk screening. Um, I think we're going to do a couple more um, days of the, or I guess it's weeks. So we like to do them. Uh, to sorry Wednesday and Friday, um, maybe another week or two of silk screening. So uh, we have tote bags and uh, tea towels, um, which is a a thing that sort of blew up for me over the summer printing on tea towels. Um, and I, I I would like to return to relief printing again and then tying all those things together. Yeah, that's really great. And if um, if people don't know from this, so Terrence is doing his own silk screening, but we do have the opportunity for you to um, create your own design to silk screen. So it's not just specifically Terrence's work, but you also can come in and create your own work as well, but with his expert guidance that we wouldn't necessarily always be able to provide. Yeah. Now it is a limited experience. It isn't the same as like, we're not doing photo silk screens. They are, um, more of um they're, we're using contact paper so it's it's more of a mono print than anything but again it's really in keeping with the way that i print i do very i call my the micro micro editions so really small small editions that are basically mono prints yeah absolutely well, thank you for taking the time to talk with me today to talk about your experiences here in cincinnati as well as what it looks like to just kind of be an artist here and make at the CAC as well as exhibit at the CAC. Thank I look forward to continuing to work with you over the next month and a half. And I would love for anyone to come join us as we make art. Yeah, please join us. We have fun. <laughs> All right. Bye Terrence. Thank you. Thank you so much.